Welcome everyone to today's webinar, the Malaysian International Food and Beverage Trade Fair MIFB 2021 is going virtual this year. MIFB is, is the future of the food business. MIFB is the largest and leading food and beverage focused trade event in the country, which offers a platform for businesses from the industry to showcase their products and services at an international trade platform. The previous MIFB 2019 was a huge success and help entrench the trade fair as the number one food and beverage trade fair in Malaysia, with a special award recognition by the Malaysian Book of Records for the largest food and beverage trade fair. In 2020, unfortunately, the event had to be postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nonetheless, MIFB is excited to be back this year, 2021, bringing to you the latest trends from the F&B industry, as well as conversations from leading industry experts. Hi, my name is Mei Ping. I'm a professional coach and the former head of governance and control at Standard Chartered Bank. Sustainability is a big part of what I do. As a corporate leader, I have led multi-million dollar strategic initiatives and sustainable frameworks for the USD $1 billion global financial institutions, banks, and fintech portfolios across 43 countries for the bank with a goal of empowering local businesses to thrive. Nowadays, as a professional coach, I help corporate professionals to achieve sustainable success in their respective fields and industries. I'm honored to be invited to moderate today's discussion on food technology, seafood, and food sustainability during COVID-19. Before I introduce our panel, our expert panelists, I invite you to share with me in the chat box, where are you from? And what is the one thing that you really want to learn from today's event? So do drop your comments in the chat box below. Now, let me introduce to you our three panel, three expert panelists today. Firstly, Professor Matthew Tan, the co-chair for, for sustainable development in agriculture and fishery sectors, APEC, policy partnership on food security. Professor Matthew Tan is a food security specialist and has been extensively involved in assisting governments with their economic transformation for aquaculture 4.0 in the light of food security. He is currently Singapore representative of the private sector to the APEC Policy Partnership on Food Security and is also the co-chair for sustainable development in agricultural and fishery sectors where he coordinates discussions between senior officials, APEC governments and the private sector on the use of technology and combined resources for sustainable development in the agriculture, agriculture and fishery sectors in the light of food security. Today, he will be speaking on the future of aquaculture. Secondly, I introduce, I introduce to you Dr. Nadan Soma Sundaram, a food safety expert. Dr. Nadan's highest education is in PhD in food manufacturing and technology. He has a master's in food science and a bachelor's degree in biotechnology. He has 11 years of experience in the F&B industries and his job background is mainly around the QSR brands, Air Asia subsidiary, Petronas's Rapid, and currently with Pop Meals. Today, Dr. Nadan will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 on fisheries and aquaculture food systems. The topic will be focusing on fishing, aquaculture, and the distribution of the products, which are considered as an essential activity in most countries. The measures adopted to contain the spread of infection caused by significant and direct uh, direct as well as indirect challenges to the sectors. And finally, I introduce to you Mr. Mohamed Hasbullah Supayano, the Senior Manager of Strategic Management Department, MPOCC. Mr. Mohamed Hasbullah Supayano holds a position as Senior Manager, Strategic Management Department, MPOCC. He leads on strategic planning and technical operational activities, focusing on establishing an ecosystem of cross-industry alliance and partnership towards MSPO certification scheme recognition and project and technical outreach management. Today, Mr. Mohamed Hasbullah will be speaking about responsible food companies sourcing of sustainable palm oil through MSPO. This topic will educate everyone with the latest update on MSPO and challenges faced by the palm oil industry on being on being responsible actors, opportunities through the growth of the food sector, and how MSPO can be a tool in securing sustainable palm oil in the supply chain. 
So here are the three key highlights that we will be focusing on during today's panel discussion. Through this panel discussion, you will get to know, firstly, how to raise awareness of the emerging aquaculture industry. Number two, the impact of the recent coronavirus pandemic has grossly exposed the weaknesses and missing links in the aquaculture supply chain and will most definitely and substantially cut into the worldwide production numbers. Get to also know the latest update on MSPO and challenges faced by the palm oil industry on being responsible actors, the opportunities, as well as how MSPO can be used as a tool in securing sustainable palm oil in the supply chain. I invite you to ask any questions or share any thoughts on today's expert presentations in the chat box. We will definitely be taking into consideration your comments in today's panel discussion. So let's kickstart today's presentation with Professor Matthew Tan, who will be speaking on the future of aquaculture. Over to you, Professor Matthew. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mei Ping, for that wonderful in, uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to just you know uh, say thanks you know to the organizer of this uh, Virtual summit, you know, I think it's a uh, very critical. I think it's a very timely, uh, you know, time to hold this, you know, in the view of, of what is happening now in COVID. Let me just uh, share my screen. The future of aquaculture. Uh, as you have known, you know, the, the introduction, you know, I'm currently the co-chair for sustainable development uh, in agriculture and fishery sector within uh, in APEC policy partnership on food security. Let me just briefly uh, introduce, you know, what is APEC all about. Uh, APEC is a regional economic forum established in 1989. Uh, it's 21 economies, you know, uh, these 21 economies we come together, you know, with a single aim, you know, to create greater prosperity, uh, greater leverages, you know, for the people by promoting a balanced, inclusive, sustainable, innovative, and we look into accelerating the regional economic uh, integration at the same time. Uh, one of APEC key concern, uh, I've been in APEC for the last seven years, but over the last five years, I see an increasing trend and you know, the concern of food security is one of the top, perhaps you know, foremost priority now you know, within the flora that I'm, I'm in. Uh, there was a survey that was done by, by Chinese Taipei and you know, it shows on food waste and loss. Now, one of the things that uh, we discovered was the, uh, we know the current world population currently is about 7.7 .7 billion. By 2050, it will reach uh, 9.6 billion. What we did was we did an empirical calculation you know, on how much food will be needed you know, by the time it reached the year 2050. Uh, the result is quite staggering. 70% more food, and we need 70% more land in order to produce that kind of food. And we know it's just simply not possible to have, you know, 70% more food, you know, based on what we really have and, and how to get 40% more land, you know, for, for farming. Now, the aquaculture, you know, plays a very important role in, in the providence of the, uh, the, the protein. And today I want to talk about the future of aquaculture. Now, before I you know, continue, you know, I think it's important for us to see, you know, how does Industry 4.0 impact aquaculture? Now, as we all know, uh, Industry 4.0 is something that's been, you know, very much talked about, uh, even at this uh, FAO and World Economic Forum. It's about the fourth industrial revolution. And in short, you know, there are a few things that I pick up uh, today that will grossly impact the future of aquaculture. One, in, in the Industry 4.0, you're going to see an acceleration in innovation and the use of technology. It's been it's been forecast that robots will take over more than 5 million jobs over the next uh, five years. So farm workers will be competing with machine, you know, for, for jobs. Now, with this in mind, it's then, you know, bring us, you know, that how do we then plan, you know, and foresee the future for aquaculture? Now, in Industry 4.0, there will be the use of big data. We all know that big data, you know, has been used more commonly, you know, for the other precision industry. But I want to say there is now you know, and increased incidences, you know, where farmers are now, you know, making use of big, big data where they know exactly now, okay, when I do my farming, you know, from the start to the end, you know, through the use of big data, they know exactly which is the right product and at what stage of farming do they need to get into to be the most profitable. Then we talk about the use of IoT. It's not new. It's been around uh, for a long time. Uh, in my previous farm, I used to manage uh, 42 farms. You know, it's one of the largest aquaculture farms 
a Singapore company that is based in, 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 in China. We use IoT, you know, because there's no way I can monitor all 42 farms. We have 40,000 tanks. The farms is spread over a lens area of 300 kilometers. There's no way I could monitor all of them. But through the use of IoT, I can now predict I can now know when will the fish die. I can now know when an algae bloom is going to hit and when I, do, I need to quickly do my uh, harvest. Industry 4.0 will also see you know, a, uh, a large surge in the adoption of new technology. Blockchain. Yeah? These are some things that usually only use in the fintech uh, technology. But I want to share with you today, I know there are blockchain technology that's been used okay, in the hospitality. I'm involved in a hospitality project large hotel chain, and they are looking at the use of blockchain, you know, to tabulate food waste and food loss. The day is going to come where if you, un, if you don't have a sustainable way of farming, if you don't have a sustainable way of uh, treating your waste, uh, uh, the supplier may not take uh, from you. So there's, this blockchain is going, to, is going to quickly evolve over the next uh, three years. Now, so the next question is, you know, we're talking about the future of aquaculture. So now why is the adoption of technology so important? Let me give you a quick background for those of you who are not from the aquaculture industry, just, a, you know, a quick a few slides, you know, so this will bring up to speed, you know, what is happening in the aquaculture uh, industry. Now, the aquaculture industry has, has, you know, enjoyed a good harvest for the last few decades. We're talking about land farm, we're talking about floating cage farm. But in the last 15 years, this good fortune has seen a rapid decline because of two things. One, we're looking at mass massive algae outbreak, you know, in the open sea. Okay. We are also looking, there's a massive disease outbreak that is decimating a lot of the farm. Just these two factors. Now, in, in summary, the environmental related factors has taken a big toll on this industry. Let's take a look at the stream industry. The stream industry is one of the fastest growing uh, industry in the aquaculture uh, industry. But since the 1970s, they've been hit by disease one after another, from white spot syndrome to early mortality, then EHP, you know, then white figure syndrome. The stream farmers is really having a nightmare. And you know, the annual uh, losses from the stream industry amounts to more than $1 billion just attributed to disease outbreak. Take a look at this, you know, press clipping. 100% mortality. Whenever you have EMS, it wipes up the entire crop. Vietnam. Vietnam used to be one of the world's largest producers of, of, of shrimp. If you look at the statistics today, their harvest has gone down by as much as 50%. Let's look at the fishery industry, the aquaculture, the floating cage, and, and the sea farm. Now, the floating cage aquaculture industry is one of the most well-developed, existed for the longest time. It has an important source of food supply. Now, just to give you an idea, just in Southeast Asia alone, uh, we, have, we are utilizing more than half a, mil half a million hectares of land and sea space, providing close to 400,000 metric tons of fish, crustaceous, and value at half, over half a billion worth of dollar. This industry has done very well, but over the last 10, 15 years, the incidences of algae bloom has been decimating and creating a lot of havoc every year. Now, for those of you who are not very scientific, uh, in, 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 you know, understand about algae bloom. Now, 20 years ago, when I first started in industry, you know, it takes maybe every 10 years, you get an algae bloom, you get a red tide. Today, you know, it's every five years, then it's every three years. Now, it is every six months we are seeing an algae bloom, not just only in, in, in the other region, but also within the Asia uh, region. Look at this. I've been following up on this trend of the algae bloom. This is uh, took place in uh, 2010 in, in Singapore. 2014, algae bloom. 2015, this is uh, within the Straits of, uh, Straits of Johor, between Singapore and Malaysia. 2016. So what is the future for the aquaculture industry? I mean, we have the disease and then we have the algae, we have the algae bloom. Now, I, I believe, you know, the future of the aquaculture industry, you know, there's going to come a time, you know, you're going to see, and because of industry 4.0, you're going to see an acceleration in the advances and the use 
of aquaculture technology. I'm going to share some example, you know, in this short presentation that I have uh, today. And secondly, you're going to see a rise of what I will call them the smart farm. Take a look at this slide. This slide is uh, taken in, you know, before the COVID, now this is taken in one of the farm, one of my partner's farm in Malaysia. Now, if you look at the stream, this stream, you know, this is a Molodon, it's a tiger prawn. It takes about uh, just slightly more than three months, you know, to grow to this size. It's the 30 gram. It's huge. It's a considered a jumbo prawn. Now, 15 years ago, it takes more than nine months for the prawn to grow to this size. Today, because of advances in stream genetics and feed, this prawn, this stream now takes only just slightly more than three months. Now, I have good news for you. My counterpart, you know, who's working on the genetics on the, uh, on the stream, Today, they have the stream that can grow one gram a day, which means to say it is now possible to reach this size of stream, 30 gram, in just within one month. This is science. This is the advances in, 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 in technology. Take a look at this. Feed. Now, one of the reasons why the fish and the, the, the streams are able to grow that fast is because of advances in feed technology. Now, this is very, very key because the feed you know, technology, we now have feed that can have what we call sustained micronutrient release. There are feed that, you know, I'm currently involved in R&D project, you know, we can now control the amount of amino acids, you know, that will be released into the fish and into the stream gut, you know, which as you know, essential amino acids is essential, you know, for what we call feed conversion ratio. It must interact with the protein in order for the fish or the stream to grow. The rise of Smart farm. You're going to see in the days to come, you know, the rise of smart farming system. The new smart farm will be small in footprint. It will be urban. It will be super intensive. And I call it the COVID effect. Now, why, why, why COVID effect? Now, traditionally, farms, aquaculture farms is always clustered into one area. Like if you go to Chinese Taipei, they're, clustered, they're mostly in Pingtung. You go to China, they're clustered, you know, within the South. And during this COVID lockdown, what has happened is that many of the farm, the, the fish were just simply left to die in the pond because of the lockdown. There were just no workers, you know, to, to come and to assist with the, uh, with the harvesting. There was no feed because the truck couldn't, co couldn't come in to deliver the feed because of the lockdown. We believe that the aquaculture industry is going through what we call a declustering. Okay, the days to come, you're going to see, and I'm involved with many, many of this project in what we call the new township planning. The new township planner wants to have the farm within the city itself. It's going to be urban farming. This farm will employ what we call climate smart farming technology. You can farm 365 days. You'll be biosecure. You will have automated harvesting. You will have be energy efficient. Uh, you know, it'll be zero antibiotics, zero chemical use. Small footprint. Now, the smart farm will have a very interesting feature. Just to give you an idea, currently in the average farm, if it's one hectare, most farm in this region, in one hectare, they produce about 34,000 kilograms of fish. In the new smart farm that I've seen, in one hectare of land, they can produce 2 million kilograms, 52 times, 50 over more times in terms of productivity uh, increase. Energy, we're talking about land base. Previously, when I first started land-based farming, you know, more than 20 years ago, I was using about 25 to 30 kilowatt to produce one kilo of fish. In the new farming system that I've seen, it only used 1.5 kilowatt to produce one kilo of fish. Now, I'm going to show you very quickly, you know, a, a, a short clip. So I'm going to exit from here, from this uh, slide here. Uh, just hang on now. How do I? Okay, let me stop share. I'm going to show you uh, a video and okay, let me just stick this on uh, share. Take a look at this video. This is a farm in Denmark. It only occupies 0.2 hectare. 
and this farm in 0.2 hectare has been producing 400,000 kilograms of fish a year for the last three years. Fully automated, auto feeding, and they have a dead fish collection system that can collect the dead fish when it dies at the bottom of the tank. Now, more interestingly, yeah, it's got a grading system within the tank and it's got an auto harvester it can harvest the fish on a daily basis on a weekly basis or and whenever you want to harvest the fish it pushes this up and the fish it drives up to a truck that's waiting outside Now, interestingly, yeah, this is a one-man show operation. They only need one person, you know, to handle this during the daytime. Okay, let me get back to my uh, let me get back to my slides. So as you can see, you know, early on, you know, this is very interesting. You know, I had the opportunity to, to visit this farm and it blew my mind. Now, in the new future for aquaculture, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for those of you who are solution provider. Okay, there'll be opportunity for fish meal replacement. Currently in Singapore, we are now, we have labs that are producing what we call seafood protein. Uh, the use of IoT, autonomous farming system, post-harvest processing. So there are many opportunities for those of you who are solution providers for in, in, in the view of the future for aquaculture. Now, finally, I, before I end, I just want to say the future of aquaculture is more than just a movement. It is smarter, it's more efficient approach that helps farmers predict the next big trend facing the industry. Now, I, I want to just quickly just uh, say this. Uh, now, the in APEC has a uh, sustainable center Okay, that serves as a platform for test building of sustainable technology. And uh, we use this platform for collaboration with, you know, technology provider, solution provider, with, you know, the other economies, you know, they are keen, you know, to do. So if you have an opportunity, if you have a solution for technology, uh, do talk to us, you know, come and approach me, you know, talk to me. The center is based in Singapore. There's also opportunity for fundraising. We have a team of venture fundraisers that is always working with us. And last but not least, okay, this is my dream. Really my dream, uh, if you look at this, this is, you know, I have good news for all of you here. In our generation, we will have more than enough food, we will have enough fish. But I think it is our children's gen generation that we need to think about. Thank you. Uh, May Ping, back to you. Um, hi, admin. Can you please enable my video? <laughs> um, all right. Okay, so, so thank you, Professor Matthew, for your presentation. And I'm sure that everyone has gained a lot of insights on Apex's objectives, the future of aquaculture, as well as emerging opportunities to, uh, within the industry. Next, I want to invite Dr. Nadan Soma Sundaran, who will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 on fisheries and aquaculture food systems. Over to you, Dr. Nadan. Thanks, uh, Mei Fing, uh, our moderator today, and I would like to thank to MIFB as well for organizing such a great um, 
Visual Expo uh, for 2021, and also the fellow um, panel speaker today, uh, Professor Matthew Tan, and also Muhammad Asbullah. All right, let me share my screen here. Okay, let us see now. Um, how are this pandemic? I mean, uh, let's uh, have an overview how this pandemic is affecting fisheries and aquaculture food system. This COVID-19 started as a locally circulating infection on 11 March 2020. WHO characterized the COVID-19 outbreak as a pandemic with a growing number of cases reported outside of China, from Eastern Asia to Europe and North America. In the first half of 2020, the pandemic entered all regions of the world, some worse than others, including many major fish producing and fish consuming countries and global supplier for fish feed. While fishing and aquaculture and the distribution of their product are considered as essential activity in most countries, the measures adopted to contain the spread of the cause significant direct and indirect challenge. All right, so that's the overview for this, uh, how uh, this COVID-19 has exactly uh, affected the fisheries and aquaculture food system. Now, let us see the captures of uh, fishery production. The drop demand, which in some cases has resulted in reduced prices of uh, fish and fish product, have stopped or reduced activity for many fishing fleets as their work has become unprofitable. In some cases, quotas has been not full fulfilled due to low demand and lack of storage for perishable product. Fleets relying on the export market are likely more to impacted uh, than those serving domestic market. For example, we can uh, tell as um, the physical uh, distance between the crew members at sea, their facial masks, uh, lack of necessary equipment, for example, uh, the gloves, and uh, also can cause the cease of activity. Limitation of input supplies, for example, we can take it as uh, eyes, uh, gear, bait due to supplies being closed or unable to provide inputs on a credit basis is yet another constraint on the fishing industry. Globally, the impact on catches have varied with many countries seeing sharp drops in production during the first week of the crisis, followed by improvement as the sector adapted. At the height of the coronavirus crisis in the United States of America, catches drop up to 40% across the country. In addition, movement uh, restriction for professional seafarers and marine personnel has not been permitted to disembark profit and transit through national territories. Uh, we can say like airports and so on, have prevented the cruise changes and uh, repatriation. Right, next, we can see this has resulted in cases where fishing crews has been stranded for many months at sea on vessels or in foreign countries without wages, thus becoming a human right crisis, especially for migrants and transitory workers. This is an area that needs building back better to ensure in future situations, these vulnerable workers have social protection. Pauses in production in the operation of fleets are also linked to potential upsides in resting overfish fish, um, for example, like um, stocks that could be spread their recovery. However, most studies suggest that as much as 10 to 15 years of reduced fishing is required to permit depleted stock to recover so. In the absence of governance, and management reform that sustain uh, reduced pressure, such as recovery to date uh, seem unlikely. Also, the decreasing fossil fuel use might be a potential upside, resulting in reducing greenhouse gas releases as required under climate change adoption and mitigation scenarios. Now, let us see what is the implication for the most vulnerable. The pandemic has created an unprecedented economic, social, and health crisis with impacts on the most vulnerable groups, including women, harvesters, processors, and vendors, migrant fishers, fish workers, ethnic minorities, and crew members. Many individuals are not registered, operate in the informal labor market with no labor market policies, including social protection and no access on the relief package or aid. This condition might be the secondary effect of COVID-19, including poverty and hunger. The small scale fishery sector is trying to make ends meet to continue fishing and provide locally caught fish, 
but is experiencing a great difficulties due to the closure of market, limited storage facilities, falling uh, the wholesale price uh, of fish, and new sanitary requirement and physical distancing measures. Because of these difficulties, many activities have been reduced and the reduction of fishing and fish farming activities will be reduced to the amount of fish available for processing and trade. Furthermore, mobility restriction will adversely affect this transfer of fish to markets. This will, uh, this will exactly, part, uh, I will tell this will um, definitely impact women who are most in charge of these activities. Food loss and waste could uh, also be an increase of processes do not have the access to appropriate storage and cold chain facilities. Frontliners employees who are processing seafood are suffering from a lack of protective equipment and clothing which highlights uh, the general lack of access to hygiene and protective equipment for the vulnerable workers of the seafood industry. In this current situation, migrant fishers and fish workers, including ethnic minorities, are unable to return to their native village due to lockdowns. They require immediate assistance, including food and transportation where movement restriction permit to reach their village. Working conditions and the safety of the fishers at the sea village is negatively affected should be the number of fishers available to crew vessels reduced. The availability of the crew may be reduced for various, uh, various reasons, including inter alia contracting of COVID-19, restriction on movement or wider lockdown. In addition, I would like to say that it's a, uh, it is difficult um, for a fisherman to maintain a physical uh, distancing measure of a meter apart on a board fishing uh, vessels. For uh, should fishing uh, vessels uh, be forced to operate with fewer uh, crew members, this may result in working longer hours, which is uh, will compromise the safety measures and thereby put the well-being and health of uh, fishers at, uh, at risk. Crew on a large scale industry vessels uh, we can tell that work in a rotation of several weeks uh, before being replaced by another crew during their work break are unable to travel home due to the flight restriction and quarantine periods. As a consequence, they are working longer periods on board, which increase like, uh, likelihood of the onboard accident, fatigue and stress. Large scale fishing vessel distance of uh, um, we can say that um, like fishing fleets are also risk of outbreak uh, of this COVID-19 cases among crew members while away at the sea. COVID-19 may spread rapidly among crew members of a vessel and medical assistance is not always readily available. Also, when we're trying to enter a, a port where the crews are not a national of the seaport status, uh, seaport access may be denied. Now, let us say what are the important um, and also the immediate priorities that we can uh, measure for now. For example, the immediate priorities one, to use the survey tools to document and better understand of COVID-19 impacts on people working at all level in seafood uh, value chain, um, consumers in market to direct uh, support for vulnerable uh, factors in the seafood system. Next, to learn from factors in the value chain that have adapted to shift in supply and demand of seafood so their strategies can be more widely adapted. And the third one will be to improve and open data and data sharing platform to facilitate the exchange of information about the social impacts of COVID-19 to enable more rapid and coordinated responses of future shocks. While the long-term priorities will be one, design a future response strategies to support a small scale fish producers and traders, draw on lessons from social safety net programs in other food sectors and experience the implementing to the human right to food. The second will be improve information system to track the fish prices and trade volumes typically consumed by uh, different types of consumers to reduce uh, um, wasted fish and enable value change to respond to consumers' nutrition needs and demand preferences. The third will be focused uh, on resilience research on those parts uh, of the aquaculture and fishery system that supply population that nutritionally dependent on seafood and those which um, through employment, support of the food uh, security of low income and also the value chain factors. Fourth, 
develop and apply an evaluation framework and indicators for seafood uh, value chains that include social, economic, and environmental aspect and identify and learn the hotspots. And the final will be tem uh, study a temporal effect um, of the shock on employment in the sectors, on migration, uh, on the adoption of technologies for production and also processing for a better design future crisis, uh, coping and strategy. And then also uh, about and to understand the recovery uh, effort. And the final one will be understand how the fisheries and agriculture sectors may or may not be different from the other uh, food sectors from a resilience perspective, uh, perspective for a COVID-19 on other large uh, scale uh, disturbances. So yeah, that's my uh, presentation for today on how this uh, pandemic is affecting fisheries and aquaculture food system. So over back to you, Mei Ling. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nadan, for your presentation. And I'm sure that everyone has learned useful insights about the impact of the pandemic on fishing, aquaculture, and the distribution of food products. Now, I want to invite um, Mr. Mohamed Hasbullah Supayano, who will be speaking about responsible food companies, sourcing of sustainable palm oil through MSPO. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mohamed Hasbullah. Hello, hi. Yeah. So we are actually a responsible body for operating or managing the Malaysian sustainable palm oil in Malaysia. So basically our task is actually to develop a system or standard and as well as technologies in order to So I think before we start further, I think uh, everyone uh, we need we need to have some sort of uh, we need to put things into perspective. You know, uh, palm oil in food industry is so dominant, all right, so dominant, and in fact, in non-food industry, so it, it is dominant. In fact, until now, uh, the top rate is that we have the low palm oil industry actually uh, drastically uh, happening around. So just to highlight that that the oil is not a it's not a solution by by take out some oil. Actually we're going to open more land more land to actually to plant other vegetable oil. So rather than try to look for why, so we need to seek sustainable sources. So our big why is uh, we need to ensure that no land extension or land Due to farm oil, they will get a better price point. We are actually trying to uh, look down on other vegetable oil buyers. We need to ensure that uh, by doing responsible sourcing, we need to those uh, companies are actually using uh, material or derivatives in their, in their supply chain. So they are, uh, um, just a quick one, uh, Mr. Mama Hasbullah, could you speak a little yeah. bit louder so that our audiences can hear you a little bit better? Thank you. Yes, sure. Oh, what, uh, moderator, maybe you can uh, see. All right, so before we go further, we need to understand actually what is the customer buyer problem, uh, problem responsible sourcing, and how we need to aware, being aware that, that uh, some companies maybe think it is the right thing to do, rather they also think this is a requirement or maybe consumer country to be consumer requirement to have that uh, 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 so-called sustainable and, and responsible in place as well as uh, maybe they thought this is a mandatory commitment uh, imposed by the government apart from that maybe uh, is it because uh, environmental social and government policies normally imposed by the banking system and 
then that actually helps in companies uh, protecting companies reputation. So this is the thing that I see uh, the, the industry especially in this, this context the SME industry uh, to think about. And then uh, eventually we need to know what is the source of the ingredient and then also we need to know how are they produced and then what's the impact uh, on, on the environment and the social by, by, by having or by procuring those uh, those elements or those uh, raw materials along the supply chain. So by having this actually we need to actually uh, uh, establish as the kit of responsible sorting. So in general, it is the act of uh, looking for ingredients that are specifically produced. So uh, Mr. Hasbullah, is still a little bit yeah. soft. So uh, just hello. hoping that everybody can hear you clearly. <laughs> Shall we do a very yeah. quick test? Yeah, hello, testing. Can everybody hear oh, no. Mr. Hello. Hasbullah? Yes. Hello. All right. It's hello. a little bit soft. Um, but probably keep the mic closer. I think we can definitely get a lot more value from your presentation. Thanks. I see. Let me let me open let me let me access the presentation. Oh no. All right. So while Mr. Hasbulla is um working how on about now? audio. All right. How shall shall we do it? Hello. Test? How about now, Miss uh, Messi? Yes, a lot better. Can everybody hear in the chat box? Can we have a quick yes from everybody? Hello, All right. testing. All right, perfect. Everything okay? All right, oh, perfect. Let's continue. Thank you so much. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. So definitely do continue uh, on. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yes. So what is the important factors in, in responsible sourcing is that we need to ensure we have a proper governance in place, especially those companies uh, that, that actually procuring sustainable or being responsible in their sourcing, they need to actually uh, have in terms of uh, uh, using credible verification system, for example, like third party verification system, such as MSPO. And as well as you need to also have uh, ensure there is sustainability uh, requirement actually imposed to your, to your suppliers, to your buyers, and, and, and also, but uh, last but not least is the traceability part of it meaning you'll be able to solve your question on source of your ingredient and you have an extra control over your, over your uh, uh, product or maybe material along the supply chain. So, so why MSPO is that uh, we can actually be part of the tools uh, that uh, fulfill, can fulfill your, your company's need as a responsible food company. Generally, we have actually improved uh, sustainability requirements uh, in, in, in the MSPO standards. Also, we have actually in terms of implementation, uh, very wide implementation in Malaysia. Also, we are also talking about potential CSPO certi uh, certified sustainable palm oil generated and estimated value, as well as your, the, the value proposition that you, you may gain uh, as, a, as, a, as a business owner. So just to highlight that uh, we have actually uh, improve uh, for our upcoming revised standard, which will be launched uh, next year. The, the important four elements as required by the international market or importing countries, I would say, on, on the alignment to UN SDG 2030. Secondly, is uh, uh, producing and co incorporated the high conservation value approach, SCB approach. Uh, also on the social impact assessment approach to all level of the MSPO standard user. Number four is the greenhouse gas calculation for the entire supply chain. And lastly, on the anti-corruption uh, management system in line with the national amended MSCC Act uh, 78, which requires mandatory corporate accountability. Also, we will, we will have a, a better coverage, uh, which eventually will bring better outcome to the industry actually by having a uh, complete uh, MSPO standards or throughout the, the whole supply chain, especially from the means, uh, sorry, especially from the independent smallholders up until the, the processing facilities and as well as we include uh, palm oil dealers as previously identified as one of the, the uh, big loophole along the supply chain. So we'll include everyone in the, in the Malaysian palm oil supply chain actually. So, if you can see this, this is actually the, the, the uh, 
the, the complete supply chain of the Malaysian palm oil industry, in fact, up until the product manufacturer. So, uh, it, mandatory implementation, we cover both uh, currently in, in oil palm management certification in the upstream side. And then actually, we, we, we may include uh, mandatory implementation of uh, supply chain certification along the downstream uh, uh, processing facilities in Malaysia. So apart from that, uh, we actually have a potential uh, SCSP or Certified Sustainable Palm Oil Generated based on our certified planted area, which is currently stood at 89%. Uh, so the estimated available volume of 17.5 uh, billion ton of MSPO CPO is actually available in the market right now based on our estimation uh, and also uh, the value actually the potential value for MSPO that uh, actually uh, available in 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 the in the market. So for your information, 47.24 billion worth of Malaysian CPO in 2020, with around uh, ringgit Malaysia 262.5 million value of potential premium. If traded, actually, this premium should go back to the industry and more importantly, the welfare of the independent small farmers and the whole industry for the effort made in ensuring sustainable farm oil production, as well as supporting the conservation efforts. So what is the, the benefit of using MSPO certified material to product manufacturer? So in, it is actually economical in terms of, uh, you, you will adopt lower cost of compliance with good quality and credibility system. And then also you have a better market access. You have to remember that uh, doing certification, we will need uh, uh, so, some sort of, uh, uh, auditing activities, you know, auditing activities, preparation costs. So what we're trying to do is actually to 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 help industry to to actually compensate uh, in terms of uh, lowering the the certification costs in order for them to come on board and get certified under MSPO. Secondly, is flexibility to growers. So a lot of companies, big companies or brands, actually uh, impose or develop a traceability platform, IT traceability platform. Uh, or technology for, for them to be able to, to trace the, the source of the material up until to the to the plantation. So it's actually require a lot of investment in this, but by having MSPO, actually we provide the, the platform for free actually to, to, to use the MSPO trace platform. So whoever certified with MSPO and then uh, transacting or selling and buying of the MSPO certified material, you will be able to actually uh, uh, monitor or trace the, the information to the system. So, so, so lastly, it's about the image and reputation. Of course, uh, being responsible and sensible sourcing, you will actually support conservation and environmental effort. Social compliance, support, and provide accessibility to smallholders to be part of the sustainability initiative. So the, the, the generally in Malaysia, the enabling measures is the in uh, MSPO is the, will, will, will actually getting the tax deduction uh, from the Inland Revenue Board of Malaysia. So whoever, whatever, whoever, uh, any companies certifying, uh, certify with MSPO, especially in the in the supply chain, uh, both upstream and downstream certification, will actually benefit the will get the benefit of tax deduction, both for the auditor for the certification body as well as the certified unit, under the recognized uh, accreditation program by Standard Malaysia, and then secondly. MSPO is being uh, imposed as mandatory in Malaysia, so you 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 actually, in a way, have a better control over the over the certification of your of your supplier and also buyer within the within the Malaysian supply chain. Yep. So in summary, uh, why Malaysian sustainable palm oil? Of course, first we don't uh, we don't have a membership fee as as in other certification scheme, meaning you don't have uh, to you need to you don't need to fork out uh, additional uh, money to be part of the system and then we provide platform and information as mentioned just now traceability to plantation and then we actually try a uh, lower we, we actually our scheme have a lower audit cost for third party verification compared to other other scheme and then we we didn't fix the MSPO premium price is we leave it to the market to decide between the buyer and the, and the seller and then uh yeah we provide free technical support for certification activities under under the scheme and then uh, uh, provide free access MSPO trace portal. And then our portal is actually reliable and also uh, uh, is secure 
in a way we are actually in the process of uh, upgrading the system in, uh, using blockchain technology okay, to, to provide more uh, assurance in terms of uh, in terms of security and also uh, in terms of the trade up until uh, the, the, the the importing countries so i would like to call upon uh, maybe the product manufacturer you are welcome actually to be part of the MSPO value chain so we have actually uh, several potential collaboration available in our in the pipeline so you may contact me or uh, according to the according to the email so you can reach us uh, mpocc so i think with that uh, may think thank you very much uh, and then apology for the technical issue we encountered just now so yep over to you uh may think thank you all right, thank you, Mr. Mohamad Hasbullah, for your presentation. Um, despite the technical issues, I'm sure everyone gained a lot of very good insights um, from the um, presentation on how MSPO can be a good tool in securing sustainable palm oil in the supply chain. Uh, with that, I want to thank all three speakers for sharing detailed insights and perspectives on their respective industries. Now, let's move on to the next segment, which is the roundtable discussion, where we will hear from our expert panels to share their thoughts on some very important questions. But just a really quick recap before we dive into the roundtable is the key three takeaways as of this point of our webinar to me is three things, right? Number one is about technology. Number two, impact. And number three, sustainability. So I think it's really important for us to focus on the opportunities that are arising during this time rather than getting caught in the panic during the pandemic. So with that, um, let's move on to the um, Segment two of today's event, which is the roundtable discussion where our experts can share a little bit more on the burning questions uh, from their respective industries. So perhaps let's start with um, Professor Matthew. So first question for Professor Matthew, does it make sense for a farm to produce many species? Over to you, Professor Matthew. Uh, Professor Matthew, you might be muted. <laughs> All right, there might be some minor issues. So maybe we move on to the next question first. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Naden. Um, is it still safe to eat fishery and aquaculture products? Yes, uh, it's definitely safe to eat uh all these fishery and aquaculture product. Okay, fish and uh, fish product are a key component uh, to a healthy diet and are safe to eat. Uh, there are some misleading perception in some countries that have led to a decreased consumption uh, of this product. Yet the coronavirus cannot infect aquatic animals, for example, like uh, fin fish, reptiles, and uh, amphibians uh, such as uh, uh, mollusks and so on. Therefore, these animals do not play an epidemiological role in spreading uh, COVID-19 to humans. While there is no evidence at all that the virus can cause uh, respiratory uh, illness that are transmitted via food or food packaging, fishery and aquaculture product can become contaminated if handled by people who are infected with COVID-19 um, and who are not following uh, good hygiene practices. For this reason, as uh, before COVID-19, is it important to emphasize the need to implement the robust uh, hygiene practice to protect the fishery and aquaculture products from contamination? So, yeah, definitely um, it's still safe to eat uh, all these uh, fisheries and aquaculture products. All right. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, just a quick question, uh, just a quick request for all of you uh, watching today. If you have any question on fishery and aquaculture products for Dr. Nadan, please make sure that you put it in the Q&A right now so that we can pick your question um, in the next segment. So the next question uh, also for Dr. Nadan, uh, will the COVID-19 pandemic affect the local as well as global uh, fish food chains? Okay, um, I think I explained this in my slide earlier. Okay, fish and fish product are among the most traded food in the world. Um, I can say with uh, almost like 38% of fish uh, or seafood entering uh, in the international trade. At the same time, fishing and fish farming are the most important at local level for the livelihoods uh, of many fish dependent communities as well as for low income countries and like uh, small island developing states. Measure to contain the spread of COVID-19, for example, uh, enclosure of food service, cessation of 
tourism, reduction of transport services, um, trade uh, restrictions, and etc., have caused a disruption in both domestic and international supply chains. The fact life, fresh or chilled uh, fish, which represent about 45% of fish consumed, are highly perishable product, present additional logistic challenges. Furthermore, widespread of containment measure can be a notable impact on nations that trade significant amount of seafood um, and reducing foreign incomes or threatening food security, keeping the supply chain open is fundamental to avoid a go, uh, global food crisis. Yeah. All right, all right. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, so um, let's move on to um, uh, Mr. Hasbullah to share um, some his additional perspectives on some of the questions uh, for the roundtable. So first question uh, for Mr. Hasbullah is, what is the current global market sentiment on sustainable palm oil? Can you share a bit more on the opportunities and challenges? Okay, I'm muted. All right, can you hear me now? All right, so uh, actually global sustainable palm oil market is valued approximately USD 16.3 billion in 2019 and is anticipated to grow with a healthy growth rate of uh, more than I think somewhere 9 9% 9 9.17% over the forecast period 2020 2020 last year until 2026 so this is the the, the figures that I get from uh, marketwatch.com so from this figure right we actually can read the attitude of the buyer trader business owner as well as maybe the country interest or in overall I would say uh, the demand is actually increasing on, on sustainable palm oil. In fact, this is actually the current trend and it is now business as usual everywhere we go actually. Let me share my experience uh, when we actually MPOC involved in the, in, in, in the G2G, government to government engagement, especially on a free trade agreement negotiation. Yeah? So actually, uh, uh, I think for several engagement, CSPO, Certified Sustainable Palm Oil or Standards, and certification become one of the major requirement. One of the major requirement embedded in the free trade agreement, FTA. So the challenges for IBUCC actually in terms of global expansion of MSPO, in terms of completing the whole supply chain until, until uh, maybe the, the importing countries, you know, uh, especially those uh, prod, uh, food or non-food non uh, product. How are we going to fulfill their market requirement? Because even though we have this, the, the stand, MSPO standard, uh, normally, the, the importing countries will also have their own additional uh, sustainability requirement that we need to address. So, uh, also the challenges on the companies uh, when we engage uh, uh, various companies overseas uh, uh, outside Malaysia is on the business decision on procuring sustainable palm oil. As we as we all know, company outside Malaysia uh, procure palm oil material from not only Malaysia but other country uh, such as maybe Indonesia. So they need to consider the uh, cost of procur procuring, uh, comply and also complying with the MSPO. Also, the limited availability of MSPO certified plantation that apparently only applicable in Malaysia on the upstream side. So we are not certifying uh, somewhere, some plantation in, in Indonesia or maybe Thailand, it's only in, in Malaysia. So that's, the, that's one of the, the dilemma or the, the, the challenges that are faced by, by, by the, the industry outside Malaysia. In terms of opportunity, it, it allows us to be more flexible, more uh, be more adaptive, and also expedite our improvement on, on the standard and also system. Meaning we try to cater the market need in terms of certification and standard, but at the same time, not compromising the credibility. So we have also an opportunity to work with uh, through the G2G platform. Uh, we provide room for collaboration for mutual recognition with important countries. So it's actually open up more uh, potential collaboration, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Mandy. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So just now you mentioned about, you know, the um, demand at the local and global level. So what is the effort that's currently, uh, you know, being taken by MPOCC to increase the update um, of MSPO by the FNB sector, both at the domestic and international levels? Can you share a bit more? Yep. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, this is uh, actually to increase the uptake of certification, especially uh, covering both uh, local, domestic, and international is actually quite challenging, actually, based on our experience uh, uh, when we actually are moving towards mandatory certification years ago, I think beginning 2017, is quite a, a, a big, uh, huge responsibility. 
And then with only 30 manpower in MPOCC, we need to cover both domestic and national, especially now we need to cover F&D industry, food and, and, and beverages industry. So internally, uh, what is the action taken by MPOCC? So internally, we cannot deny that we need to address both internal and external factors. So internally at MPOCC, we streamline and actually re-strategize our resources and expertise to get us prepared for the new focus area, especially on expanding MSP globally, and also to transform the entire global supply chain. You know, So it is quite a, a big challenge uh, ahead of us. So this also includes continuous effort in our system improvement. Uh, when I say improve, uh, system, it includes the, the, the scheme, the MSPO standard, and also the technology that we, we try to bring or to, do, to deliver to the market to, to achieve the desired credibility. So it's, that is, it's actually a, quite a huge task for MPOCC. So all of this without leaving our local stakeholders behind, behind, meaning we still need to ensure our local stakeholders also come on board. So uh, I think I just, uh, just want to take this opportunity to say uh, that MPOCC team really deserve an applaud for making MSPO uh, up until today and maybe the, for the planning for the, for the years ahead. So especially from our board CEO and our staff, I think it's a teamwork actually uh, from MPOCC. But with limited resources, we make a good partnership with uh, the, our, with the other agencies like Malaysian Palm Oil Board, Malaysian Palm Oil Council, and also Matrix. Uh, Malaysia External Trade Development Corporation. We try to actually leverage their presence in the international platform, trade platform, and reaching global palm oil industry, including FMD industry. So to increase uptake, we also intensify effort in raising the profile of MSPO for domestic and international FMD industry. And last but not least, as I mentioned in my presentation, we develop a strategic collaboration with various stakeholders in increasing the uptake. With the focus now, of course, with FMD industry. So you are most welcome to to reach us anytime. Yeah, mm. Thank you, Mayfield. Okay, so he definitely a lot of uh, responsibilities um, in terms of opportunities and exactly. challenges, um, <laughs> you know, by the MPOCC. So again, um, for all of you who are listening, if you have any questions at all for Mr. Hasbullah, make sure that you put it in the Q&A section so that we're able to pick it out a little bit later. So lastly, let's move on to uh, some questions for Professor Matthew. So first question, um, Professor Matthew, does it make sense for a farm to produce many species? Uh, there is a recent study uh, that I was involved in. You know, this is actually commissioned by, by FAO. And they wanted to find out, you know, that uh, should a country, this is on the country level, should a country produce many, many species instead of just concentrating? Uh, and I know from the initial conclusion from the studies that was done, it was found that country that concentrate on just a few species, especially if it's endemic to their country, their productivity, you know, is a lot more. Now, my, my advice to, to farmers is producing a lot of species may seem like a good way, uh, you know, to buy insurance, you know, although I, I make sure I can sell a lot, you know. But if you don't, if you don't concentrate and specialize in a few species, uh, when the market begins to grow, you'll find that the, uh, uh, your resources, you know, you're going to be very, very severely, severely stretched. So I will usually encourage uh, companies, you know, to, to, to remain focused. They need to know where is their strength, uh, what they do. Uh, my previous job, you know, I was with uh, this company. Uh, we are one of the world's largest uh, hatchery for abalone. We just specialize in abalone. Every year during the spawning season, I was a CTO. We spawn between 300 to 500 million babies every, every spawning season. And we became the largest uh, hatchery in, in the whole of China. And as a result, you know, we actually, I actually visited the other neighboring hatchery. I said, look, you know, you, you, your cost of production is about 10 cents roaming P. I I said, look, my cost is only 5 cents. I sell it to you at 7 cents. Every piece that you buy from me, you save 3 cents. So as a result, you know, when we went to this specialization, uh, we, we get our cash flow, we get our turnaround, and the farmers are happy. So I will usually advise uh, farmers, you know, specialize in what you're good at know where where's your niche market and do very very well in just one or two species but don't go for too too many yeah uh, all right thanks professor matthew for um sharing so just a continuation question from that right so uh, in terms of like specialization like i guess to what extent should a farm specialize right in the as you know as part of the entire farming process is it just a portion or should they be involved in all stages what okay do you think? so in, in aquaculture farming, there's four stages. I should describe that as four stages. One, the first stage is the brook stock. That's when you have your parent stocks. Okay. Second stage is hatchery. 
Third stage is nursery. Fourth stage is the, the, the grow up part. Now, you need to first of all look at what are the expertise you have. Everybody wants to go into hatchery because hatchery is the easiest business. You know, if you know how to hatch, you know, uh, within 25 days, some of them don't even have to fit. They can sell the babies. They can make a good uh, money out of it. But hatchery has got the highest risk because the larvae are more susceptible, uh, you know, susceptible to death and disease at, at the age. You know? So I will say to the farmers is, if you want to specialize, okay, you must know, you know what are the resources that you have. Take for example, if the resources that you have, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing a project uh, near Borneo Island. This is in Malaysia. And it tells me that, look, you know, Matthew, I got 12 hectares of land, you know, uh, in, 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 in this Borneo Island. And, you know, we want to go into this species of farming. And, and when I look at their, their, their farm, wow, pristine water, completely seafront. It will be a waste if they don't make use of that pristine seafront because the seafront that they had, you know, is not a shipping channel. Uh, similarly, when I was doing my, uh, my, in my last company, uh, we had pristine seafront, you know, phasing, you know, and we had abundant use of water and it's not a shipping channel. Uh, so if you have are open to such resources, you know, then you should consider the grow up. You can also consider doing the hatchery part. But if you have a land that is based, you know, someone ever came to see me, you know, I'm just located near Genting's Highland, you know, which is just, these are all very hilly areas and they don't have much, you know, of uh, resources, trucking, you know, and etc. Then I say, look, no, then maybe you should just really concentrate on the, the easier part, you know, perhaps growing the brook stock, you know, a part of it. So you need to know, I mean, there's no, we don't have a one, uh, one size fit all. You must again go back and to see, and this is where we do a lot of analysis, what we call feasibility studies for companies, you know, for farms, you know, and then we help them identify where their key resources, where, where is the part where they have what we call the best cost comparative advantage. In aquaculture, it's all about dollar and cents. You can have to produce the best fish, but if you're not compatible in terms of pricing with your neighbor, you will lose up. Hmm. All right, all right. Thanks so much, Professor Matthew, for sharing your insights. All right, that's a wrap for our roundtable discussion segment. And I'm sure all of you have gained deeper insights into today's presentation. And of course, if you want to share one thing that you have learned, you're feel free to uh, share it in the chat box. All right, so now let's move on to the Q&A um, session. And thank you so much for submitting your questions. We have picked out a few um, for our expert uh, speakers. All right, for the first question, um, let's, since we are talking about um, aquaculture, Professor Matthew, so the first question will be for Professor Matthew. Um, this is a question from, uh, okay, I don't have the name. So what is your opinion on those people who are still hunting sharks and whales, particularly, you know, um, yeah, for I guess those people who may be a bit concerned, right? Um, yeah, so what okay. are some thoughts on that? So I, I, I must declare I'm a nature lover. <laughs> I'm also a scuba diver. You know, I do a lot of diving myself because we will, you know, going to look for our bookstore, look for our fish. Uh, I want to say, you know, I, I'm certainly not in favor. You know, it's really very cruel. You know, you cut off the fin of the shark and then you leave them, uh, put them back. You know, it's, it's not like, it's not like some other species where they can grow back. You know, it's not like a crawfish. I do a project with crawfish. A crawfish, you cut off their limbs, they will grow again. Yeah, within one, two months, you know, this is the way they are made, you know. Uh, certainly, I'm not in favor of that. But I think this has been a long contested, you know, long debated, you know, uh, history. And I think the age group of people, the category of people that still uh, consume, you know, uh, shark fins, you know, I, I think they are a minority group now. Now, moving forward, I want to just say this, yeah. Uh, last year, we were very, you know, I was in a, a conference, you know, and, and, and at the conference, you know, it was presented the world first lab produced stream meat, you know, the prawns is made from the lab. Okay. It's a reality now. Technology has moved really, really, really fast. And my challenge to them is, hey, can you do shark fin for me? If it's possible, they just need to have the tissue. It's all about tissue, culture, tissue, engineering, you know, the scaffolding engineering, you know, for, and then they finally they could produce uh, it. Today, uh, in Singapore, we have, you know, uh, lab produce uh, milk. You know, you don't need to have a cow. I have tasted cheese that is made from nuts. Uh, so I think it will be a reality. I think if I'm going to try to start a campaign to stop the cutting, uh, it's going to take a long time. But I think if we were to move towards uh, lab-based uh, protein, uh, I hope all this cutting and killing of the fins of the whales and the shark, you know, it should stop soon. Yeah, personally, I'm not in favor of it. Thank you. All right. 
Thanks for sharing, Professor Matthew. And I think like, you know, it's all about education and awareness. And I think more importantly, embracing what technology can really offer in the future. So, okay, just a next question uh, also to Professor Matthew as well. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on biosecurity plan? Um, how does it actually work? Okay, so biosecurity plan is a must-must, yeah? Uh, let me share an experience that I had uh, just not too long before the COVID you know, started and all my travel came to a halt. Uh, I spent, before the COVID, I spent every, every three months, uh, every two months, I spent uh, 14 days, two weeks in Africa. I'm a principal consultant to one of the largest fit new uh, there. Uh, because there was announcement, you know, on the, 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 the African government wants to stop the import of fish so as to protect their own industry. They wanted to encourage the farmers uh, to farm. When I first visited Africa, four countries, Nigeria, Ghana, Egypt, and Ivory Coast. Now, the, the, the way of farming is very rudimentary. And I realized that they have no biosecurity at all. And they tell me, say, you know, Prof, you know, I put the fish in three months later, only 10% survive. So when I first broached this subject about biosecurity, it was so new to them. Now, biosecurity, you know, it's, it's, it's like a car. You have a basic uh, 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 Toyota. You know, you have a Hyundai. Then you have a more upmarket, you know, maybe an Audi. Then you have a Mercedes. Then you have the Rolls Royce, you know. How security can take form in many different forms. Now, because this is Africa, I, I applied a very rudimentary and a basic form, you know, where I can cut off any form of bacterial uh, contamination to their open pond. And I want to say, you know, within uh, nine months, uh, some of the farmers begin to experience more than 50% uh, increase in their production. Biosecurity is, you know, about a few things. One, how do you prevent the spread of disease? Okay, the spread of disease essentially comes from the water. It comes from formites. Formites are things that, you know, like your pails, you know, uh, the holes, you know, who is the holes, you know, that will carry in, in the birds, yeah. Uh, you just need to know, okay, how do you prevent, you know, the invasion of this bacteria through the water, through the pond, through the birds, you know, through uh, human uh, interaction with disease uh, animals. Uh, biosecurity, if you were to Google, unfortunately, I can't do a lecture over here. <laughs> it takes too long. Uh, just Google on basic biosecurity. And depending on where you come from, if you come from a state where uh, having a building, it's not possible, but you're on an outdoor, then you opt for very basic biosecurity. Keep the animals out, keep the, you know, uh, put an overhead netting, you know, from birds that will, will come in to, to, to rest. Put in a half a meter uh, 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 fencing, you know, to prevent the monitor lizards from going in because these are the carriers of uh, diseases, you know, they, even though they are, they are host, but it doesn't affect them. If you can build a building, make sure that there's netting, you know, no birds can fly in, you know, insects can fly in, you know, to go and uh, lay the eggs in, in, in the water. And the water coming in and out, make sure that it's from a different source, whatever wastewater going out, it goes up to another. So make sure you treat the water. Okay, so there are very basic biosecurity. You do you just have to think, okay, how do I prevent, you know, uh, in the layman language, how do I prevent the cockroaches and the lizard from coming to lay eggs and to give birth to babies in my house? This is biosecurity. If you can keep your house lizard cockroach uh, free, you know, apply the same husbandry uh, 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 mentality and techniques to it. You'll find that, you know, within three months, four months, five months, six months, and I've seen this in the last 18 years I've been in this line. You know, farmers, even very rudimentary farmers, they are able to double their productivity. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Matthew. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, it is all about managing risk for your business. So um, thanks, Professor Matthew, for the very useful tips. And, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, risk management. So whatever that you can do practically for your business to reduce, mitigate, ideally eliminate, then make sure that you take the first step. All right, so we'll move on to questions um, uh, for the next speaker, um, for Dr. Nadan. Uh, okay, first question. Uh, my concern is food, food safety systems which cover freezing, chilling, and storage facilities, including um, delivery systems. Uh, any thoughts around these concerns? Right, uh, thanks for the questions. I can see that uh, the questions has been asked by AC Lam. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lam. Uh, Right, let me uh, explain you like uh, when it's come to pandemic or when, when it's come about uh, to answer when the COVID, does it affect uh, the entire food safety chain or the food system? Um, it's quite 
um, hard to answer. Reason because up to now, we don't have any evidence to say that um, um, the fisheries, aquaculture or any products that can be contaminated if handled by the people who are infected with COVID. Because up to now, we don't have any like solid evidence to say that, okay, this um, virus is like transmitting via food and so on. But it is important um, for us uh, to always uh, remember and to uh, maintain uh, this hygiene practice all over in the food industry, like um, to, uh, to avoid the contamination of, uh, for this product. Like uh, normally in food safety system, we say like from receiving uh, up to the delivery and so on. The process of sanitation, the temperature deals and everything should be in place. So I think this should be fine. And then um, uh, to answer your question, I can say that for now, we don't have any solid evidence to say that this pandemic will be affected uh, or affected uh, via food and so on. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nadan. And I think for this um, situation, education and awareness for food handlers and I think secondly processes in place to make sure that they know what they're doing for all of our safety uh, exactly. okay a second question for Dr. Naden as well uh, what is your opinion on processing seafood and meat-based products under the same roof in a factory environment um, even though separation by paneling you know low care areas are provided you know is cross contamination a potential risk that we should be concerned about all right. Uh, those who, are, who ask the question, I think you already have the question, but maybe you want to like double confirm. Okay. Let me like explain here. We, we have two different things here uh, when it's come to food safety system. It's either to decide on operational view or on a food safety view. Because um, normally like I, I worked in uh, FMB sectors and so on. Normally the operation sites, they want like numbers, the productions and so on. But are we really following the food safety system? For example, when they ask like uh, food uh, processing seafood and meat-based product on the same roof, it's actually a not... Uh, it's acceptable in the food industry, but uh, we have different things. When we want to process the protein, um, we will define that whether it's allergen or non-allergen products, uh, first uh, of all. And mostly those companies, uh, I mean, uh, the food industries that really following the food code system like uh, HACCP, ISO 22000 and so on. Let's say when they want to produce like allergen and non-allergen food, uh, they will divide it into shift. Let's say shift A is like handling all these allergen products uh, like the seafoods and everything. And then the shift B will be going like the meats and so on. But due to like some operational issues and so on, but some factories are like running that boat in same, uh, I mean, in the same shape or whatsoever, in the same uh, uh, timing and so on. Then uh, the question is like, even though separating by paneling and high care, uh, low care areas is provided, uh, let's, uh, like I told just now, even though like they separate the allergen and non-allergen product, as the first question I say, how are we dealing with this food uh, uh, processing? Uh, for example, in uh, certain factories, we have like um, those who are handling the allergen products are not allowed to deal with these uh, non-allergen products. So we, there are different departments and different sections. But uh, nowadays, I'm not really sure because I, I've been in a, a company when I go for audit, all these um, workers who, are, who handle the allergen and non-allergen are doing the same thing. So it's like... Uh, uh, a case why we call as a cross contamination and so on. Yeah, uh, it's really a high potential risk if let's say we are having a same uh, safe or uh, shift or same schedule like uh, processing all this uh, seafood and uh, I mean the protein like allergen and non-allergen at the same time. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Nadan, for sharing. Yeah. And I think this is actually another point that's back to processes that are in place, which is the first thing, but monitoring yeah. and auditing is something that is so important. And I actually used to be a former auditor, so I completely understand what you're saying. <laughs> so exactly. um, both implementing processes and actually monitoring auditing that these processes are implemented will be really crucial. All right. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Nadan. Um, okay. Move on to the last um set of questions for uh, Mr. Mama Hasbula. So first question, um, what is the realistic timeline to increase certification and compliance as many suppliers to multinational uh, companies require compliance to MSPOS approved suppliers? Uh, what do you think? I think I just recap my answer in the chat box. Uh, actually, we almost reach, we can, we, it is actually possible to reach 100% certification for our Malaysian uh, supply chain, I would say, at least to ensure everyone uh, be in the MSPO, within the, the MSPO ecosystem. 
So put aside first whether they are actually violating any requirement. But what we want to do is to ensure everyone come on board and be and 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 actually uh, certified with MSPO. So I we also need to consider the 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 how to say the involvement of, of our small holders. Uh, they need more time to actually comply, especially in in, in terms of capacity building and also and also uh, uh, to get them ready for certification. So maybe maybe the the the, the how to say the the reasonable timeline maybe by end of 2022, I think we can reach 100 percent. But of course, as I said, within the the MSPO ecosystem, whoever violating. Whatever non-conformities, as you all know, in auditing, so they need to actually uh, do some sort of a uh, corrective action, right? So that's 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 better. That, that they're all being checked rather than uh, they're all in, not in the system. So that's we try. That's what we try to do. And then I think the biggest challenge now to to, to actually to expand our supply chain certification uh, overseas. So this is actually quite a, a, a challenge challenging uh, task actually. Uh, due to, as I mentioned, due to the company, uh, sorry, due to the country's uh, restriction, for example, or non trade barrier, they maybe impose some sort of uh, FTA into it, and then the the, the problem with the procurement uh, for the for the foreign companies. So maybe that one, maybe we cannot estimate now what is the what is the the, the reasonable timeline for them. But how long there is demand from the overseas when they are in the system? Obviously, they actually will procure MSPO certified material, and which eventually will drive the the, the compliance in Malaysia. So eventually, we will link all the chain from Malaysia to the to the importing countries. So that's our 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 take, lah. Mm, all right, all right. Thank you, Mr. Hasbala. And as Mr. Hasbala earlier mentioned, NPOCC is working very hard. To <laughs> on all the on you know implementing the frameworks and compliance, so uh, just make sure to submit accordingly, and I'm sure Mr. Hasbullah's team will, will be working very hard to on the compliance for you. Okay, just a last question uh, again for Mr. Hasbullah as well. Uh, what is the extent of compliance to MSPO certification, like especially among uh, smaller holders? Uh, we actually uh, certified uh, almost uh, around forty seven percent of of uh, small holders in Malaysia. That's why I we need to factor in another another the balance uh, for another I think a year uh, next year, but uh, I I cannot assure that we can achieve hundred percent for small holders next year. But I confident uh, our our sister agency doing the the, the certification for small holders now working really hard to get them on board, and also we will appoint a third party verification body, the certification body to do the audit, and then we expect to see the uh, maybe the increase the, the significant increase. Maybe starting next year for, for, for smallholders. Yep. All right, all right. Thanks. Yeah. It's great to know that there is a plan for smallholders. So uh, everything is really mm -hmm. good. Okay, all right. Um, so we have reached the end of today's uh, panel discussion and I just want to uh, take this opportunity to say thank you to Professor Matthew Tan, uh, Dr. Nadan Sonasundaran and Mr. Mohamed Hasbullah Supayano for sharing their expert insights and perspectives on food technology, seafood and uh, food sustainability during COVID-19 in today's panel discussion. I also want to say thank you to every single one of you who took the time to join today's panel discussion and I'm sure that you have gained a lot from our experts today. Connect with us and definitely reach out should you have any questions and I'm sure that our panel speakers and, and experts will be happy to share a little bit more of you directly. So uh, thank you once again and I'll see you next time and I wish everybody a great weekend ahead. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.